Hello everyone, this is Rich. I am the moderator for the Indie Plus Game Night. That's Pound Game Night for April. And we're talking, uh, this theme is comedy. And we're going to be having a panel with four fabulous guests, all game designers and smart fellows. Uh, they are uh, from left to right. Uh, we're all going to be talking about comedy RPGs, or, or why comedy RPGs suck, more or less. Uh, and so I will start uh, first with uh, Brennan Taylor. Brennan's a game designer and owner of Galileo Games. Uh, he founded Indie Press Revolution, which is a website dedicated to making independently produced games easy to find and buy. He's also written and self-published five tabletop role-playing games, all of which have made me laugh, even though some of them are serious. How are you doing, Brennan? Good. Thanks for having me on. Good, good. Next we have Daniel Solis, uh, who's just... A mastermind of layout and design has a number of games out, including uh, Happy Birthday Robot and Doe Pilgrims of the Flying Temple. He's an art director by day and a game designer by night. How are you doing, Daniel? Very good. Thank you for having me. Thanks for coming on. Uh, next, we have Jared Sorensen. He is the he, he runs Memento Mori Theatrics, designed a host of humorous games, including Inspectors, Free Market, and Octane. He's also hosted a number of live panels on game design at conventions across the United States. And he ha happens to be banned from Big Purple, which is RPG.net, uh, all the way back from 2006 for pulling a, an April Fool's Day prank. So you know that he's quite amusing. How are you doing, Jared? I have something on the stove, so I might have to get up at any time. <laughs> just to warn you. Just to warn you. So if I suddenly leave, it's just because, you know. All right, and next we have Tim Rodriguez. <laughs> Tim was hailed as the second best Dungeon Master of 2011 and has run several people's funniest game ever. Uh, he's produced a couple of games, including Ghost Pirates, as well as uh, Hyper Reality. How are you doing, Tim? I'm doing great. How are you? Oh, good, good. All right. Well, thanks, all of you, for coming on. Uh, we have crowdsourced for a number of questions about why comedy RPGs suck, and we're hoping that all of you can educate and enlighten me on why there are no good comedy RPGs. Only The, the only good RPGs out there are the ones where you, you kill things and take their stuff, pretty much. Um, <clears throat> Any opening statements about why comedy RPG stuff? Any just kind of general thoughts from anyone who has actually played a, a game and, and laughed from time to time? Uh, um, what's, a, what's a what's a comedy RPG? I guess. What do you want? How do you how do you want to define it? Yeah. How do we want to define a comedy RPG? I think a number of people uh, we have answers that run the gamut from games that are written to be funny uh, from a read or games that produce humor at the table. We've got some really good questions lined up for that, but what is a comedy RPG to you, Brennan? Um, I think probably something that was written in, with the intent to be funny, but I find that those comedy RPGs that are written like that are actually funnier to read than they are to play. So, Daniel, uh, what is a, what's a comedy RPG to you? Uh, I, I'm probably, I can probably best uh, define it by example, so I think uh, The Adventures of Baron Munchausen is, I think is probably the most successful of a uh, game that tries to be funny, but is also funny to play. Cool. What makes um, Adventures of Baron Munchausen funny where other games fail? Well, I can't believe this. I mean, I, can't, I haven't played all games or read all games, but... From uh, other games that you've read. <laughs> <laughs> um... I, I like Baron Munchausen main, uh, mainly because it captures the the in, in being funny in its in itself. It also communicates the way you're supposed to be funny, and and a lot of people read it. Uh, they can almost tell like, all right, I'm not going to dig this because I I can't be funny in this way. While other people who who are really like kind of self aware and and know how they are funny, uh, if they like that kind of, I'm rambling. Why am I rambling? It's good. It's just good. Jared, answer this question. Jared, answer. This. <laughs> Jared, please enlighten me. Uh, what makes a comedy RPG, or what makes a, an RPG comedic? Well, first, I think we need to define the difference between science fiction and sci-fi. <laughs> <laughs> and I would say, uh, Call of Cthulhu, hilarious. <laughs> if you're the GM. 
Uh, so comedy game for the GM, not comedy for the players. Uh, and uh, most comedy RPGs suck. <laughs> There's Glenn. nothing in the game, apart from the text, that supports the premise of this is going to make you laugh. Because there's usually no premise. I can think of three good comedy RPGs. Four, well, four. Baron Munchausen's not an RPG, Daniel. Bad guy. Um, yeah, what is? <laughs> but Ooh, listen, no dice. I'm looking at my shelf, and I do own all RPGs, unfortunately. And if anybody would like to buy them, please uh, email me. Um, there's not a whole lot other than a couple. What's one that comes to your mind right now? Uh, funny to read, Paranoia. Hilarious, really well written, really funny, really witty, really smart. Um, nothing in the game supports that. Uh, funny to play, tries to be funny to read, um, but reads more like a doctoral thesis on comedy is Elves by Ron Edwards. Well, most games that I've read by Ron Edwards read like a doctoral thesis, so I think that's a schema or something. Yeah. Yeah. Tim. What what makes you you've 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 done with the funny? What makes a, an RPG comedic? What makes an RPG comedic, or what makes it funny? Oh, sure. nice! Because people make it funny. I think um, comedic RPGs. I think is just like a weird term because. RPGs are about playing roles, and uh, comedy, sort of in like the stand-up tradition, is about holding up a mirror and looking at absurd things. You know that's why jokes are fun, right? Because they look at stuff in sort of turnabout ways. You know, puns are one of my favorites. You know, so I got a emailed picture from the internet that was two baguettes cut out like slippers, and it said loafers. <laughs> I thought this was really funny. Right? It's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Um, you know? It's because it's something real that's twisted. So. All right. Well, let's, um, let's see if maybe uh, some of the questions that we've received from our followers can get us some good discussion going about aspects of comedy RPGs. Um, Adam Mini, uh, Brendan, I'm going to start with you. Adam Mini asks, uh, does comedy act in opposition to, or is the distraction a goal or task-oriented role-playing? Is it a distraction to task or goal-oriented role-playing? Yeah, is com is it com com does comedy, being funny, does that get in the way of getting stuff done in an RPG? Uh, no. <laughs> I mean... I get stuff done. In, I get stuff done in inspectors. That doesn't mean it's not funny. It's funny. Uh, you know, the, there's a lot of humor in Bulldogs, which is one of the reasons you asked me on here. And that is a task-oriented game. There's, you know, the the humor. I, I think you know people being funny to make the other players laugh uh, can be distracting. But if you're working the humor into what you're, you know, what is going on in the game, it's not a distraction. It's not a problem. Uh, Daniel, do you, do you find when playing a comedy RPG that, that it's not about actually achieving any goal, uh, or just being funny is the goal? Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know. I can, I can probably speak to... This is going to sound so, so shilly, but uh, I, when, I play, when I run Doe, um, people, uh, people are like really focused. Chill. Yeah, I know, I know. But <laughs> when people run, uh, when people play Doe, they're like, um, I think what 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 they're getting out of it is like, there, there's a very specific goal of like helping someone out of trouble, um, and when they do that, uh, they'll often get into trouble as a result of that. And and I, I think I don't think I don't think they're they're divergent agendas in, in a game design. I don't think I, I think you can. Just as easily be achieve a goal or set a task and have players pursue that goal and in doing so do something that's funny or result in something that's funny. I mean, if it elicits, elicits a laugh, then I'm like, all right, cool. Cool. 
Uh, real quick, just to jump in, if you're watching this on the YouTube feed or through the Google Plus, uh, any Plus page right now, feel free to give us any questions and I'll try to seed those in with what we've already got. I'd love to have uh, some live interaction with you guys. And the other thing is just a skill, a shill warning. Okay, since Daniel uh, doing his magical oh. dance down there brought it up. <laughs> hey. I brought all of these guys on specifically because they have made RPGs that are considered funny or have made me laugh. And, I, you know, the games that they've made are because they have thoughts about it. So they may give examples from games that they made, and that's okay. And if oh, you I thought that was the deal. I thought that's, you know... <laughs> I'm not even going to mention Nathan. my own game at this point. I don't want to be a shirt. <laughs> Happy birthday, Nobody wants to hear about it anyway. <laughs> right, yeah, no one wants to hear about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, show warning. I want these guys to show their games because it is their thoughts on comedy that help bring these games to life, right? So uh, please show and give examples, right? I want examples from your games if you have specificity to give me rather than talking way up high on this level of comedy is this unreachable goal or mountain or is it thing that just happens. Uh, so now that we talk about comedy RPGs and how they happen, can you get anything done in a comedic RPG, Jared, or or does it stand in the way, or are they two completely different objectives? Are you muted, Jared? Yeah, I'm muted. Uh, I was pensive. <laughs> <laughs> if I do this, yeah, I'm very thinking, and I'm covering my mouth. So you can't tell if I'm actually speaking or if I can hear you. Except for the mic. Okay, now I'll mute myself. <laughs> so, Tim, um, I'll go ahead and ask you. I'm, and, and maybe we've exhausted this, but does comedy act in opposition to, to getting stuff done or, or task-oriented role-playing? No, goofing off wax in opposition. And that's funny sometimes. Um, but comedy... But I don't think so at all. Here's the thing. Like, I think that's sort of half the point. Like, there's a certain difference between goofing off and, you know, just, like, actively going against what you're doing um, as opposed to being funny, which works just fine. Well, um, just to kind of follow up on that, and this is also from Adam, what... What challenges or opportunities are there when you're trying to balance that that's humor with actually telling a coherent story? Um, what are some tools that a game can give you to help you keep the story going without derailing off on comedic uh, venues or, or side quests that are just to be silly? Um, I built a whip into my game so that when <laughs> players uh, start goofing off, you can hit them with it. And that works really well, actually. Does that come with a game, and which game is it? Uh, well, it would have been funded if Hyperreality had been uh, <laughs> had, uh, <laughs> made it through Kickstarter, but oh well, so no whip. A print and play whip? Is that yeah, the... that's, that's going to be it. It's not going to be very effective, which uh, is going to just lead to more goofing off, I think. I don't know, paper cuts are dangerous. <laughs> that's different. Uh, Jerry. You get no satisfying yeah. crack. Can, what can a game do to help balance that that track of keeping the story moving along, or, or you know, having plot plot happen while also being funny? What is this obsession with plot and story in role playing games? People are insane. You ever been <laughs> in a D&D game ever? Yeah. You know it's popular, right? Yeah. There's no story. There's a lot of funny stuff. Um, poker games are funny. But when people are losing money, they, uh, they don't want to laugh as much. So basically, the, the purpose of getting together with your friends to play a role-playing game is to sit down and have fun, is to laugh, is to tell stories, is to goof around, and it's to roll dice and fight monsters and whatever it is that you do in your game. The problem is when whatever you do in outside of the game is getting in the way of what you're trying to do in the game. If everybody's content just to screw around and, and tell dick jokes for a half hour, that's your group's prerogative. Uh, the problem is when one or more of the players is getting a little aggravated and frustrated because the thing that they are there to do is not getting done. 
Now, if you're playing a game like Vampire, that stuff's going to be frowned on pretty seriously because most vampire games, even if they're incredibly goofy, Malkavian-driven uh, laugh fests, there's still that element of horror and there's still that element of, of carnage and monstrous behavior. Uh, so eventually they're going to be like, you know, this is, this is getting in the way in the mood that we're trying to convey. If you're playing Paranoia, same thing, ironically. Um, the goofier it is, the more you're kind of demolishing the premise of the game, which is you are in a horrible, horrible environment. Bad things are happening to you. Now, the difference between Vampire and Paranoia, you are horrible people in a horrible environment doing horrible things while horrible things are being done to you, is in Vampire, you're trying to embody the character, which is, it's a horror game, so you're trying to, you know, experience life through that character's eyes and, and how they feel. And in Paranoia, uh, it's not you. So it's the classic comedy line about tragedy is what happens to somebody else. You know, I think it was Mel Brooks said, uh, I stub my toe, it's a tragedy. You fall in a manhole, through a manhole and die. It's a comedy. So in Paranoia, you don't identify with the character. The character is kind of this, uh, this little avatar that you can manipulate and you can watch bad things happen to. I think any comedy game that's good puts a, puts a giant divide between the player and the character. And the, the character's like a little puppet. You get to make him do horrible things and have horrible things done to him. I, I am, I'm imagining all the people, all the things that have happened to Robot and Happy Birthday Robot, and and the horrible situations that they put them in. So the guy who made a kids game. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> if you if you've seen a kid play around with a doll and the things they do with a doll, yeah, it it gets pretty hairy. <laughs> um, but uh, so so it's you know it all boils down to what are you there to do. Um. Now. If, if in the course of playing the game and doing what you're supposed to do, people laugh, then there's no problem. You can laugh the whole game. And it has nothing to do with things getting accomplished or task-oriented or, or, or whether you get into the story. It just, it's like, have we accepted that we're going to laugh all the way through this damn game? Or is there a general consensus that we are not going to tell Monty Python jokes, uh, make fart noises with our armpits, and do horrible puns on every single character NPC name that the GM introduces. If you don't talk about that stuff, the new guy who shows up might not know what's expected. So you might get the person who's playing inspectors totally serious, uh, which is how it's supposed to be played. And then you get the person who shows up and is like, oh, it's a comedy game. I'm going to be totally goofy. And everybody's like, dude, you're ruining it. So it's all about expectation, like any role-playing game. What the hell are we trying to accomplish here? As long as you talk about it, it'll be okay. So really, it, it, is that something the social contract level, or, or can you work that into the mechanics? Daniel, what do you, what do you think? Can you work that, how, what makes it all funny, or what's our funny for this game? Can you work that into mechanics, or, or is that just something that happens at the table? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I... I uh, I, I can put on my game designer hat for a second here, and and yes, me, you can mechanically do this, but uh, you also have to be you have to have to present the mechanics in a way that makes it clear what it is the mechanics are trying to do. Uh, because if people come into it with a different expectation of what the mechanics are trying to do, then it can break the machine in a, in a way. If you're trying to use a toothbrush to drive a car, it's or no that that doesn't work at all. Um, if, if the engine is designed to do a particular thing and you're make, trying to make it do a different thing, then it's not just not going to work. Um, but if everyone is kind of in agreement about what it is the engine's trying to do and they kind of let the engine do its thing, then yeah, you can you can kind of engineer and experience it as you like it. Uh, I tend to I, can, I tend to design very draconian, very hyper structured sort of things, but uh, but yeah, I mean I, I think it's doable. Well, for Happy Birthday Robot, what kind of comedy do you think you you engineered? Uh, Mad Libs. It's a Mad Libs uh, storytelling game. Uh, it's it's the it's the funny thing of, uh, you know, choose a noun and you write fart. Choose a choose a verb and you write fart. Uh, and it's it's totally adolescent elementary school type humor and uh, and that, that's all that's all there really is 
uh, in, in the game, but uh, people dig it. Uh, they, they like the constraint, for one thing. Uh, they like the distance between, between themselves and the character that these things are happening to. Um, and, yeah, that, that's the kind of humor that, that is just solve part jokes. Happy Birthday Robot is sort of the Twitter role-playing game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you mean by that, Tim? Uh, it's all about constraints. Um, Twitter gives you 140 characters to uh, do things with, and Happy Birthday Robot makes you roll dice to see how many words you get to use. Pretty much. Did you guys know about Og? Og is great. Yeah, I haven't it played hurt. it yet. Similar thing. You get, I think there's 30 words that you can use, period. Right. And the advanced edition, I think, gives you 31. <laughs> uh, and it's the same thing you have to get your point across uh, by using those I don't even know if it's that many words but yeah, you have to get it across yeah. using just those words um, and gestures and gestures yeah sure yeah and cave paintings maybe I don't know it's the um, you know what you know what this is it's, it's limericks if, if you have a certain format like a limerick and you follow that format, you kind of get into a rhythm of knowing where the funny is, and, and it makes it easier to, to make the funny within that format. Is that why all Happy Birthday Robot games are really dirty? I, I did not design it that way. <laughs> you, know, you, guys, you guys know Sid Caesar, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. Good. Uh, Google him for those who uh, don't. So he did, and I tr I've tried to find this on YouTube, and I've been unsuccessful, so if anybody finds this, please let me know. He did this thing on some television show where he told a joke. Now, he's famous for, for speaking in gibberish. He'll just, like, adopt this fake language, which is just obviously just garbled nonsense. He actually told a joke using gibberish, and it's funny. <laughs> it's got a setup. It's got, like, a, it's got a body, and then it's got a punchline. And you get the, – the crazy thing is you get the joke, and it makes you laugh. Wow. <laughs> And oh, the, reason the, why it makes you laugh, the reason why it makes you laugh is because it sets you up, <laughs> and instead of giving you the twist, which is what a lot of jokes give you, they kind of set you up and then kind of veer right all of a sudden, and you smash into a brick wall. What Sid did was he gave you exactly what you expected. Uh, and for whatever reason, that, contrasting with the fact that you had no idea what the hell he was saying... <laughs> made it look funny. Have a friend, from, have a friend from Poland who did the same thing. He has a joke, uh, which he said in Polish. And uh, all you needed to hear was the punchline in English, and you got the entire joke. <laughs> nice. Well, tell the joke. That's awesome. No, no. Oh. <laughs> you have to meet a Polish person. <laughs> You knew that was coming, Daniel. Why did you walk into that? That's yeah. that's that's your homework, everybody uh, watching at home. Go go meet a Polish person Have and get them to tell you a joke. <laughs> so, Brennan, um, and, and just to give credit, John Lommers asked the question about forming a group consensus on on what kind of funny they're after. Do you have any, any tips on how somebody trying to make a, a comedic RPG, how they can kind of codify that or, or mechanically reinforce it? I really i am not sure that you can do that. Um, I'm, I suppose you probably could. I, I don't think I could. Um, I don't know. I find like the, the, the things that work in RPGs are tend to be absurd situations. Uh, a lot of the comedy, you know, arises from characters trying to do stuff that's somewhat ridiculous. I mean, Fiasco is one of the fun, fucking funniest games I've ever played. It's ridiculously funny, uh, and it's awful, right? And that's it's the awfulness that makes it amusing, I think. You know, um, so it's it's having these. It, it's it's part of that thing that Jared was talking about, which is the the separation of you from the character. You're observing horrible things happen to people, but uh, some of the humor is arising from the fact that it's not you that has to go through this. So, yeah, I think uh, codifying that stuff is difficult. I, I think Tim tried to do that with the with hyper reality, right? Is that what you were after? Is trying to codify that to a certain extent? Well, I mean, in that uh, you and know, the reality shows are silly and. Reality shows are silly, and 
the group consensus tends to be like, okay, what kind of show are we playing today? It's like, oh, let's play uh, Cowboys in Planescape and go from there. And and so that ends up being pretty funny. I'm I'm giggling. Yeah. Where are we going? Yeah. I'm laughing, but I'm on a delay, so it's not gonna. Yeah. No, I can tell. <laughs> Timing is everything, Jared. You need to catch up to us. Um, there are universal principles of humor that, that you can seed into a game um, Poop. to create the, the right conditions for funny. Poop is funny. Yeah. Poop is always funny. True. I agree. I, 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 I think that's... Anything hard, besides... Uh, hard consonant sounds. Why are those funny? <laughs> it's a principle of comedy. It? It's, it's also a principle of ordering stuff at Starbucks. <laughs> That's true. That's true. When you give them your name, hard consonants. Hard consonants. Yiddish words. Yiddish words, yes. That works better in some neighborhoods than others. Well, oh, it's okay. Uh, Chris Okay. Um, hmm. Let, let's let's change direction then. Great questions, um, audience. Tim, Chris, <laughs> uh, Tim uh, Chris Trigenza had a, a question that I thought was pretty interesting. How um, when when you write a comedic RPG, do you need to to set up any barriers to keep people from taking the comedy to uncomfortable levels? Is this something you should be aware of as a designer? I think there's a lot of different opinions on this, and I say let people push their own buttons. I have no interest in holding people back from what they want to do. Because um, things that I like to joke about and things that other people like to joke about are different, you know? While I'm not a particular fan of dead baby jokes, although there are some really, really funny ones, it's not the kind of uh, comedy that I necessarily want in the game. And so I'm not going to write something about that, but if it works for you and your group. I mean, RPGs are all about inventing things and telling your own stories, and I'm just here to provide a framework for that. You can say no dead baby jokes, right in the rules. Yeah, but... Yeah. I'm not going to be playing with those people. So, you know, they can do what they want. No, Tim. Timothy, I know you. <laughs> you cannot get away with the, well, you know, I can't control what they do. Well, then why write a book of game rules? I'm controlling other things that I care more if, you about. Know, the halfling gets a plus one of the dexterity, so I'm not going to put it in the game. You know, that's, come on. How would you do it, Jared? What? Just how would you do it? How would you control it? Write the rule and say, don't do this, or do this. <laughs> Does it, I mean, do you explicitly say, don't tell these jokes? Uh, or do you... I wrote a game, a... so Octane, you mentioned, which is vaguely comedy. I don't know. Um, there's I, funny I... things in it, but it's not a comedy game. Uh, so Octane has a rule of three, which says... Describe your character in three, basically three words or phrases, and that's it. So, leather jacket, combat boots, spiky hair. Boom. That's it. That was your so self-description? You your and you're not allowed to say anything else. Can you? Yes. But it's against the rules. You are cheating. Am I going to come to your house and beat you up because you, you know, said that you had gray eyes? I mean, blue eyes? Um, I mean, <laughs> green, blue eyes that turn gray when it's stormy outside? No, but That's I would like to. That's one thing. I would like to. <laughs> so you write the rule that you want people to follow because you want, it to, uh, you want it to focus the game in a certain way or make the game go a certain way. That's called game design. It doesn't have to be about, you know, the plus one to hit or the initiative bonus or how much damage a law rocket does. You can say stuff like, the player with the longest hair goes first. You know, that's a rule. You can say, if anybody makes Monty Python jokes, you lose five hit points. That's a rule. 
Oh, thank you. Because uh, James, James Mendez Hodes had asked, um, how can we most effectively eradicate Monty Python references? I think that's a good one. <laughs> Don't allow Mendez in your game. <laughs> <laughs> that's a rule. That's a rule. <laughs> it's a good that's rule. That's in Inspectors, isn't it? Right. Yeah. Uh, Dan, Dan, Daniel, how, how, um, yeah, how would you create that? Do you just explicitly say don't don't make this type of joke, or are there other ways to kind of mechanically reinforce the bad the, to, to to punish people who make the wrong kind of joke? <laughs> Daniel's run out of words, and so I'll be answering for him. <laughs> Punishing people who make the wrong wrong kind of joke is, you know, if you're Jared, you know, somebody coming to your house. If you're me, you know, you'll be asked to maybe leave the table. You know, I think, I, I think I'm answering for Daniel. Go ahead, Daniel. <laughs> I, uh, you know, that's, I mean, that's pretty much my answer, too. I mean, there, there's a lot, there's a, quite a bit of stuff that I'm not comfortable with at the table, uh, and, and there are boundaries, you know, that, that a lot of people have, just for whatever reason, and and that their reasons are their own. Uh, but um, you know, like, I, I, I can take a kind of example. Um, a lot of people are not going to play uh, Cards Against Humanity for some for some very good reasons. Uh, a lot of people are playing Cards Against Humanity, and they're laughing. They're laughing a lot. Uh, but there there are just some combinations and some cards in there that are just like, nope. Nope, not touching it for a lot of people, and that's cool. That's their prerogative. But um, I, I think in sitting down to the table, if your if your game is clear enough about what it is and how it's funny and what it's about, uh, then then players and whoever's running the game should all, all be on the same page. And if there are nuances that need to be adjusted or talked about beforehand, then hopefully they're talking enough to do that. Um, if not, then I guess that's a problem with more with the group. Maybe, I don't know. But I have no, I have no trouble like setting, setting down boundaries. Like, nope, not doing that. But Happy Birthday Robot doesn't say don't play dirty games. It does not, and um, mainly because it, in in stating what you couldn't do in the game, uh, the game would be a lot longer. <laughs> So I mean, if, if you have these prescriptive things uh, and restrictions and, and, and all that stuff, then then yeah, you're going to spend a lot of time worrying about what a lot of people are going to do that you don't like. Uh, so instead, I, I just focus on like right, this is this is what I want to do. Like I, I'm just going to make this game that's you know ostensibly for kids. People are going to drink and play it with a bunch of grownups, and that's cool. I've seen some really racy uh, Happy Birthday Robot games, but um, that's fine. I mean, that's that's how that's how they enjoy the game, and and technically, I mean, they are still playing the game. They're still in the spirit of the game. I have no problem with it. Do you think that, well, Daniel, just, just to kind of keep talking about Happy Birthday Robot because... Uh, Do we have to? Because <laughs> it, it, it's so funny to watch you be uncomfortable talking about your own game. Because oh. you, you haven't done it very much. Uh, oh. <laughs> The art direction that you took, um, the way that the book looks, seems to indicate or connote a, a certain style of play. Was that, uh, that that was a conscious choice, right? And that's an option that you have as a game designer is to make the book look like a certain type of humor. Yes. Um, I thought it was unconscious, and you did that while you were sleeping. Yes. Techni and technically, that's the role of the publisher. The publisher gets to determine that. Which is why we all self-publish, so we don't have to listen to other people telling us we have to write. Yes. True fact. Well, I got to hear from Brennan. Brennan, are there any ways that, as a designing a game, that you can steer people away from certain type of of funny and towards the kind of funny that you want to, out of your game? Well, yeah. I mean, there's a certain amount of. Uh, you just got to. Who's got the siren? Is that you? Yeah. That was Tim. <laughs> I muted you, Tim. Sorry, buddy. Tim lives in a war zone. You should tell people to like drive better or something. I know. I, I mean, you just tell people not to do it. I agree with Jared on that one, and just add it into the rules. Say this is not. This is stuff that's not appropriate. I've done that for things other than comedy in my games. Um, yeah, people can break the rules and play it that way, but. Uh, 
yeah, if you're aiming for a specific kind of humor, I think it's good to be uh, explicit about that. If you're trying to communicate things in a rule, I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't try to hint at it, uh, especially if it's something that you don't want to see happen. Just say, don't do this. The best rule I ever put in inspectors was don't be funny. <laughs> yeah. It's it's because without that, without that prohibition, it becomes just awful. It becomes painful. It's like to it's like just gamer nerd humor for an hour and a half, and it just sucks. Uh, the the worst thing you can do in a role playing game is try to be wacky. People are just funny. Uh, if you're if you're playing with people you know and you like, there you like them because they're funny. Uh, and you don't need to to amp up the wackiness. You can play somebody who's completely straightforward and normal and hilarious. The funniest people you meet in your life are people who don't even realize that they're funny. You know, Jared, I'm, I'm going to... You might think of me, I'm telling you, I'm yeah. saying you're wrong, but I, I actually... <laughs> saying, here's the thing about inspectors for me was, yes, you said don't try to be funny, but then there was a follow-up point in the book that said when you make your guy or girl, when you make your character, make it somebody that someone would meet and hire for this job. Right. Well, that's, yeah, that, the, the actual thing is um, don't create a psychopath and don't create somebody who's so unlikable or so wacky and zany that they wouldn't end up in this game as a character, uh, which is, it conveniently is means they were employed for inspectors, uh, a company, so it's pretty easy to say, okay, who would I hire? Like, it's, it's, it's one thing to say, uh, don't create a character who's wacky and zany. It's another thing to say, would you hire this guy? Because that's very concrete. You can just right. think real life and go, this guy's insane. There's no way I'd want him working with me. He sounds like a, you know, a maniac. Um, so that's a, nice, that's a nice real-world example that you can use in the game. The, the key point there, I think, is that you're defining a positive rather than defining a negative. Like You're, you're, you're directing people to, be, to create a character that is hireable, not just well, don't be wacky. Well, I'm a very positive person, as you You know. are. You are. Very upbeat. I feel the love. Yes, right there. Well, for some reason, we haven't heard much from Tim lately. Um, I don't know why that is. <laughs> Tim, so John you Lummer's... You now, Tim. <laughs> you can unmute yourself, Tim. John Lummer's also asked, uh, how can you keep the players from trying so hard to be funny that nobody's laughing or having fun? Um... Pure pressure. Pure pressure works really well. Um, at my regular gaming table, we have one player who constantly makes puns, and uh, yes, yeah, no, I, I generally like it, except that his puns are terrible. Oh, yes. And so no, 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 like beyond terrible. Like I really like the terrible kinds, but man, when you're, yeah, no gaming stories. Anyway, basically we all sit around and make better puns than him, and that's the peer pressure we offer, which is all really funny. Um, it hasn't stopped him yet, but <laughs> it's at least inspired him to up his game. So how do you fit that in the rules, man? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that it's a, a champion's power set. Jared, how, how can you, other than, I think... The inspector's example is really strong. Um, but how can you keep players from trying, just trying to be funny? Are there any other ways that you can codify that in a rule? There are uh, a million ways to do it. Um, so I did a game, a series of games called Parsley. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> love those games. No, that was for the people at home, not for you dicks. Um, <laughs> so I run those games. They're, 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 the way I run them at conventions, I run them for large groups of people, like 50, 100, 200. Um, the, and, and everybody, there's three types of people. There's people who have no idea what the hell they're doing and just want to, like, get done with it on their turn. There's people who want to accomplish a goal, like they have something in mind and they want to do it, whether it's smart, stupid, whatever. Uh, and then there's people who just want to fuck with me, and I love those people because they can say exactly one sentence before I get to kick them off. So I don't care if they're funny. Sometimes they are, and they, they crack me up. Occasionally, somebody will just slay me with something or just stupefy me with something, and I'm, I have no idea how to react. Um, but the way, you, the way you 
the way you uh, um, God, now Daniel's mental virus is infecting me. The way you handle players so that that, that would be otherwise be long winded is you say, okay, end of the line, that's it. You got one sentence. Um, any kind of pass the stick mechanic is good for that as well. Whether it's, um, I think there's one game I have that's online, happy, lucky Chinese restaurant game. It's not very good, but it's free. You can Google it. It's a game you play after Chinese restaurant meal. And the rule is you can speak for as long as you can speak without taking a breath. Nice. And it's not really a comedy game, but it does, you know, it, it helps to, to move the things along. Unless you're like me, and I haven't taken a breath the entire conversation. <laughs> Daniel, um, do you have any other ways that you can help the group to, to, to be funny and not be not funny? <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, so, so we're trying to make them funny now? Well, how can you keep the players from trying so hard to be funny that nobody's laughing, right? It, how can you do that in, in the game text? Uh, I mean, the, 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 the one, met, there's a lot of methods. The one method I use a lot is constraint, and I think I've talked about that already, just because it's, it's, when you have people, um, when you give people a form and they can fit easily within that form and contribute something within that form, then, then people feel a little, a little bit more relaxed about not being under the spotlight. People are, people are weird in front of a crowd or whenever they're called upon, kind of like when I just kind of lose my train of thought. Um, so if they, if they have, you know, like a meme that uh, they can just, you know, one line at the top, picture of a cat, one line at the bottom, and that's, you know, people can make that joke all the time. The reason that the Got Milk ads have mutated for 30 goddamn years uh, and, and persisted is because got and then blank question mark is super easy for people to make a really bad joke in, in, that, in that framework. Uh, so I, that, that's the easiest, at least I, I find it the easiest um, uh, method to get pe make people at ease uh, in contributing something that may or may not be funny, but at least they don't feel stressed about one way or another. They're just like, all right, I can, fit, I can say three words and that's it. If they're funny, that's fine, but at least I've made my contribution. I think that's the key, too, is making a contribution. Don't just don't put all the responsibility on one person to be funny. Um, the Internet is way funnier than any one person because everybody's contributing little pieces and everybody's playing off each other. And you say one thing that's totally not funny, and then some person puts a little zing on it, and then another person, like, amps it up, and then another person repeats it until it's not funny anymore, and then another person repeats it until it is funny again. <laughs> I mean, most improv troops, uh, you know, no one person is telling jokes. It's just the kind of gestalt of everybody working together is what makes the thing funny. Yeah, and I think that's yes. what works best for RPGs, just because what you're creating at a table is a lot more like an improv group than it is like a comedian coming up with jokes and then telling them to everybody. Those right? are the you're, worst, yeah. <laughs> I know. Well, no, the, they are funny. The guy at your game table trying to do that is not funny. Wait, have so. you been to a stand-up comedian sh comedy show? You live in this area. Come on. <laughs> okay. that were really funny? I watch the highlights on the internet. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I only watch the funny bits. <laughs> so yeah, that's the thing. Yeah, you, you, you're getting that uh, that comedian who's trying to work out his routine on you when you're doing that at the table. It, the the situation and then building that up with everybody contributing a little bit and a little bit until it gets funnier and funnier. That's what RPG humor is about. So, should put that in the rules. Yes, you should. Well, that's Daniel's, Daniel's game is like that. That's what Daniel's it's, game is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how uh, when I do the parsley games, since everybody gets one sentence over the course of the game, everybody's feeding on somebody else. You'll do callbacks. You'll do references. Uh, repetition. There's nothing funnier than somebody climbing a tree 20 times in a row. <laughs> <laughs> up, down, up, down, up, down. Oh, man. After the 17th time? Fuck. It's amazing. <laughs> this keeps getting funnier. Brandon, let's, let's stay with you. Um, this question it comes from John Lommers. Uh, how do you change the challenges or conflict to allow for the funny actions to succeed rather than failing miserably? Uh, I don't know. Failure is hilarious. Uh, 
<laughs> I think that there's a, a lot that of, of humor to be found in not succeeding at things. I don't know. Uh, I think that comment is coming at game design from a different direction than I usually do. I don't quite get what he's getting at. What's the direction that you come from? I mean, let's talk about Bulldogs specifically. Failure, that's some... Tell me about Bulldogs, right? I, I want you to show. Tell me about Bulldogs and, and what's funny about Bulldogs especially or what can be funny. Well, it's it's one of those games that the funniness is in the bleak horribleness of it. Uh, you know, you're essentially characters who are on the very bottom of society and you've been given a job where nobody gives a shit whether you live or die. So all the humor comes out of the fact that everything is trying to kill you and uh, your, you know, your, your fellow crewmates are probably psychopathic as well. And so, you know, basically the worse things get, the funnier it gets. Uh, it's like fiasco in that way. <laughs> uh, Fandible just played, you just put a podcast uh, ver game online and they had some hilarious stuff in there, including a robot that wants to kill the entire crew and they keep it locked in a closet because uh, it's useful when they get boarded. They let it out and hope it kills the. <laughs> now, that's funny, right? Uh, so that, you know, the, 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 I wouldn't call that success or failure. Honestly, it's more failure than success. The robot's a psychopath, right? <laughs> What's successful about that? What, what, you know? I, I think you just got to find the the humor in the situation more than you do in like uh, the uh, this task is a, is a, is humorous and so it will succeed. I I don't quite understand how that how you would work that. Okay. I understood, uh, Daniel. You know, can you approach this? Do you have an answer for it about changing, uh, changing the paradigm where the conflicts are about uh, funny actions, something funnier, judging hilarious to be the thing that's successful? Is that is that going to lead to a funny game? Success, you mean? Yeah. <laughs> uh, chant usually not. Usually, usually some, something going horribly wrong, or slightly wrong, or unexpectedly wrong, is is usually what what makes something funny, or or actually, um, uh, one of the one of the big little bits of uh, advice that that I got from uh, from someone um, was if you want to make if you want to make an interesting, uh, if you're a GM and you want to make a, a funny situation for a player, just let let them succeed too well. And and when they get too much of a good thing, usually they have a, a much more interesting reaction than if they were just they just failed. And that that seems to be that seems to be some interesting situations whenever I've run a game. But I don't actually play RPGs, so I'm not really sure if I'm. <laughs> That's a joke, right? If you play your own games. <laughs> is it? This game aren't uh, RPGs. I'm not either. sure that it is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I will remember the first time I met you, you were playing Suro. So I've never seen you play an RPG. Suro is totally an RPG. What are oh, you talking yeah. about? <laughs> <laughs> Flying dragons, hanging out, making friends, kissing. Did have That's an RPG. Dancing around, so there's that possibility. I, you know, I'm going to paraphrase a question. Well, actually, Jared, do you have, do you have an answer other than the two from before on... Uh, uh, making conflicts funny or uh, success failure? Have you read Inspectors, Rich? Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of the thesis of that book. <laughs> 2001. Uh, hey, would it be funny if it didn't matter if you succeeded or failure, but who got to say what and whose, uh, whose agenda was on the line? Um, divorce success and failure from the die roll entirely. Uh, you can succeed and that just means you get to say what happens. I've had players uh, put themselves in horrible, horrible situations. Ironically, uh, <clears throat> funny because you know dramatic irony, um, being an incredible source of comedy. Uh, one of one of the players way back. Um, you may know him from his award-winning role-playing game, My Life with Master. Uh, Paul Shanger, whatever, however you pronounce his last name. I think it's. Sh Chaguaya? Chaguaya. Chaguaya. It's Shaggy, right? 
So, Shig- uh, Paul Shigarawada, um <laughs> he played a character, and uh, I was attacking with a little, you know, little tiki doll guy from uh, from the trilogy of terror, and little voodoo doll. And um, I said, okay, uh, Paul, um, you know, roll the dice, see if the thing stabs you in the face or whatever. And he he lost the die roll. So normally I would get to say what happens. But I was like, fuck it, I don't care. Tell me what happens. I was feeling generous. And he described the little Kachina, or whatever it was, a little tiki doll, jabbing him through the eye with the dagger. <laughs> and it was hilarious. It wasn't. I mean, it was horrible and brutal <laughs> and awful. But we were dying. because We're like, you could... I just handed you like a little pot of gold that said, "Yeah, I'm gonna let Say you go away. You, you know, want, right? Yeah. You can get away with this. You know, you can escape." And no, he. And then it, later it came out that he didn't. When we cut back to him, the, his glasses had stopped the little dagger. But we were on the floor because we just could not believe that he would do that to his character. So as soon as you divorce success and failure from, yes. um, you know, task and ten, all that theoretical bullshit. Uh, you you open up the game to be funny, just like uh, in any game, right? Uh, my my classic example is the Indiana Jones game. Uh, not, I'm sorry, the, the Indiana Jones movie, not the game, not funny at all. <laughs> yeah. uh, I don't know what happened in the end; might have been funny. But, but uh, I, I I have Indiana Jones, and man, oh, it smells uh, not just because it's been sitting in some of these attic for a long time. Uh, but Indiana Jones the movie and Ghostbusters the movie, those characters never succeed. Which, which makes the thing funny. Uh, <laughs> RPGs strive, uh, they live on failure, because failure is where you introduce complications, you introduce that that yes but or the no and, uh, which every improv troupe will, you know, expound upon at length about why that makes things funny. So I won't. Don't let them. Just stop them before they even uh, start. Don't hang around with improv, improv troops. Terrible people. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, and. (laughs) Tim, uh, you got anything to to tackle that? Uh, Uh, I steal all my good ideas from Jared. Literally, sometimes. (laughs) Yeah, no, that's that's pretty much it. All of them. This is why Jared doesn't hang out with me. Don't you live in Brooklyn? (laughs) That's maybe also part of it. That's probably the major reason. <laughs> well, Jason Corley, who's listening um, through the, the Hangout on Air right now, one of his comments was uh, in, in like Primetime Adventures, where you have fan mail, that mm. you could cr- create a reward mechanic that was a group consensus. And, hey, that was funny. I, I just laughed out loud. Here, here have, a, have a chip. Um, is, that, is that something that, you know, is that a, a, a possible solution, Tim? Uh. It totally functions. I mean, Dinosaurs in Space does that too. Um, And that's an awesome game. Um, That has a really sort of awkward dynamic, though, because uh, when somebody's... Yeah, when when Adam Dre takes all of the chips, all of a sudden... Turns a little bit on it because now somebody else is the GM. <laughs> they have all of the narrative control. It's weird. Um, I think that it's great to reward somebody for being funny, but I think that it's more effective to do that by laughing. Yeah. Because when when somebody's funny and you laugh, you know they get the real response. You don't need to put a mechanic in about it, um, you know, unless you're, you know, giving out XP based on how many people laugh, um, in which case you start getting into the, what might be the trying too hard because then you're creating that positive feedback loop. Waka waka. Hey, Rich. Yeah. Aha, I get XP. Yes. Okay, now I'm going to tell another joke. And now I'm going to tell another joke and keep trying so hard. <laughs> hey, yes, more XP. It's really easy to fix that. Um, just give everybody one shot. And when they do it, here you go. Here's your, here's your little Benny. You're done. And you can keep making jokes, but that's all you got. Nice. 
then, there's, then there's games like there's other games, uh, not really comedy games, but games that deal with tropes. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Pantheon by Mr. Robin Laws. It is fantastic. Uh, it's one of the little unsung gems. It came out exactly at, exactly at the same time as, as uh, Munkhausen, uh, one of the new style games. And in that, you're rewarded for, for following along with genre tropes. Um, so if you're playing the wisecracking uh, cook aboard the doomed ocean liner, um, played by LL Cool J, uh, every time you crack a joke, you get points at the end. Or if you die first, you get points at the end. Neat. Again, it's, it's all about expectation. Cool. Uh, well, we're coming up near the end here. I have one question that wasn't submitted for this, but uh, I think it could lead to some interesting discussion. We'll find out soon, or this will be over. Um, Jason Pitt uh, is currently thinking about game design from the aspect of how do you, how do you make a game that is able to allow for people who are the quieter players uh, to also have a contribution and, and to structure who says what to where, not just the loudest person is the person that gets the narrative control. Brennan, from a, if we apply that to comedy, right, how, how can you create a, a game that fosters funny or, or being, being amusing and also encourage people who aren't confident in their ability to kind of step up and, and be the comedic person. Uh, basic mechanic to help people stop, you know, standing back is turn taking. Uh, I mean, how we came to live here uses that uh, to keep anybody from getting left out of the story. And you could do the same thing with the with the comedic game. Although I doubt you'll get a joke every time you come around, but. It gives people time to think about stuff, too. So uh, a lot of comedy is spontaneous, so I don't know how well it will work with turn-taking, but I don't know. You've got uh, Howie, uh, sorry, uh, Happy Birthday Robot. That's a turn-taking game. So Yeah, but you took that You took that one. So let's go in turn-taking. Daniel, what's one thing that you can <laughs> codify? I took it, yeah. In your face, Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> So turn taking's been taken. Um, <laughs> he took my turn taking. <laughs> What's another way to get everybody, even the people who aren't comfortable, stepping up into the spotlight uh, in a comedic RPG or any, any RPG that can be funny? What's a way that you can encourage that? To make them feel more comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, well, I mean, yeah, taking turns uh, is one is one way. Uh, constraining the the size of their contribution is another way, so that the people who are more inclined to be verbose uh, are constrained in doing so, uh, and people who are, who are a little more quiet can, uh, can get an opportunity by taking turns to think about what their contribution is going to be. Uh, honestly, those two in combination are pretty powerful. I mean, I don't know that you need much more than that. Uh, there are, there are, I'm sure there's other ways to do it, but I mean, those two methods are so good that I rarely stretch beyond them because they're just it's good on their own honestly. so jared there aren't good enough for me yeah uh, so give me a third jared uh, a third method or, or a game mechanic that you can use to to get everybody on the same playing field okay real life example dying earth role-playing game uh everybody is given a piece of paper with a line on it a humorous line and it might not even be humorous. It's more um, when that line is used is really when the comedy gets generated. It's kind of like a fortune cookie. Uh, the people who, you know, when they give you the fortune cookie, they have no idea what one you're getting. You're going to read your own uh, situation into it, and especially if you put in bed at the end of it. It will be funny. Um, so in, in Dying Earth, everybody gets fed a line at the beginning, and it's your job to somehow weave that line into the plot. Uh, how, how and when you do it, then you get a reward for doing so. How and when you do it is what generates the comedy. It could be something very, for one thing, the lines are usually kind of funny and droll in that kind of fancy way anyway. So it's pretty easy to say them, as long as you can pronounce all the words. Uh, it's usually easy to, to, to say the line and get a chuckle, but it's when you say the line, right? It's timing as well as delivery as well as material. Those are kind of like the, that's like the holy trinity of comedy. Um, the other thing is not everybody should be loud and in the spotlight, uh, just because you need that quiet player. If only for that game, because the next game, they might say, 
I see my chance and they'll take it. And it's even funnier because they've been quiet the entire time. The classic uh, thing from, I can think of from the movies is, uh, is Jay and Silent Bob. Jay's the funny one because he's constantly, constantly saying bizarre and ridiculous things. But the one who gets the biggest laugh is when Bob says like one sentence and just kills because it's so out of character. So when that silent person finally comes around and says that one line and kills everybody, it's worth the seven sessions where they've kind of been kind of meek and low-key. So little, little uh, uh, people who are quiet or not really loud or boisterous, just chill out, don't worry, your time will come. Just take, it, take the shot when you're ready. Nice. Tim. I've got three um, good tools, but I want a fourth. Yeah, I got a fourth. I've been saving it, too. Um, Hyperreality uses an interrupt system, so uh, which uh, you, can, you can score confessional tokens in Hyperreality, and any time during the game, you can slap down one of these tokens, stop everything that's going on, and have your bit. And you get to... Offer all the leading narrative you want to make somebody, put somebody into, uh, all of a sudden an alligator pit opens up beneath them, or all of a sudden they find out that they're making out with their sister, or, you know, any number of hilarious things. Cool. All right, all right guys, uh, as we wrap up here, I want to give each of you just kind of a minute to shill, because I think it's important for people who uh, have heard what you have to say to know what what kind of games you've said it with as well? So Tim, lead off. Tell us a little bit about some of the games that it, that you have put out. And uh, uh, okay, so um, Ghost Pirates is a tactical action board game. It's on shelves now. Ask for it. Look for it at your local friendly neighborhood game shop. Um, Hyper Reality was on Kickstarter, but you didn't fund it, so you don't get it, suckers. Uh, that's not true. It'll be out at some point when layout eventually gets finished. Cool. Jared, tell us about Memento Mori Theatrics. What are some funny games that we can get from you? Welcome to Action Castle. <laughs> See, I got one laugh already. I didn't even start the game. You get XP. No, you don't. No, Here's you some fan mail. Game. I don't do that. Um, so my website, you can Google my name. It's right there in front of me. A cham. Oh, shit, I missed. There. Uh, Gweggle me, and uh, you will learn about all the wondrous things I've created. Um, and more. If you're our next to you. Cool. Uh, Daniel Salas. Uh, I have not designed a role-playing game in a long, long time, so <laughs> most of my games are uh, card games, actually. Um, Bell of the Ball. Uh, Bell of the Ball is uh, going to be published by Dice Hate Me Games. Uh, it's going to be on Kickstarter later this year, and it has a bunch of silly names in it that are, that are fun to say. I'm not going to say them, though. You have, to read, you have to buy the game. No spoilers. Yep. <laughs> And Brendan, I think you you were filming earlier today. Yeah, um, I was. <laughs> tell us a little bit about uh, about that and, and where we can find your Galileo game stuff. Sure, uh, Galileo game stuff can be found at GalileoGames.com, which is you know logical. Uh, my funniest game is How I Came to Live Here because that's uh, that's hilarious. Uh, no, Bulldogs is actually funny. Uh, How I Came to Live Here is serious. Mortal Coil can be funny. Um, oh yeah. <laughs> yes, yes it can. <laughs> uh, basically, I create a, I've created several different role-playing games. I like humorous stuff. I like serious stuff. So it's a mix of all. And uh, what we're coming out with this summer is called the Ministry Initiative. It's going to be a steampunk game uh, using fate. And uh, I suppose it could be funny, too. Nice. Well, I want to thank all four of you for coming on and, and being part of Indie Plus's Pound Game Nights. We talk about comedic RPGs. Also, just as a, a quick heads up, Eric Jensen uh, is on, uh, and he has stated that we're all wrong, and he will be blogging about what is uh, really funny in RPGs. So I look forward to reading that, Eric. Thanks for watching us, and I appreciate the feedback. We're Anyone on else the has... panel. <laughs> Whatever. We're on the panel. 
<laughs> so it's true, you're on the panel, but that doesn't make you more right. It just means yeah. you're on the panel. It totally does. So, uh, again, yeah, thanks, everybody. We were more right, so. All the RPGers can just, like, all right, just, just argue amongst yourselves. I'm, I'm going to be with Eric, <laughs> Eric Jensen, the carrot top of role-playing games. <laughs> Hilarious. I look forward to reading your amazing blog post. Man, Eric, I, I didn't call you out. I was honestly saying that I appreciate your feedback. Everyone who's watched and listened, I hope that you enjoyed this. And, and please hop onto the YouTube channel and give us some feedback and, uh, as we continue the pound game night. Thanks, guys, for being on, and we will go ahead and end it tonight. Coming up at 9 p.m. Eastern, uh, which is about an hour from now, I'll also be talking to some game masters and players who will talk about bringing the funny to their tables. Hopefully they will be funnier than these four guys. <laughs>